Um, that 2013, there were 1,713 people killed on the roads in the UK. And that was the lowest figure since 1926 when records began. And also the casualties, which there was 138,000 of them, was the lowest amount of casualties since 1927, the year after statistics began. Now the thing about them as well is all of the categories of statistics like motor vehicles, motorcyclists, pedestrians, all of the trends in those were going down from 2000, from 2000 to 2013 on a trajectory to make things safer. The only one that stood out was the amount of deaths and amount of um, casualties due to, which involved cyclists which have remained static for around about the last 13 years. Now, does anyone here know how many cyclists were killed on the roads in 2013? Anyone like to hazard a guess? 14? Uh, uh, in the whole of the UK it was 109. And there were nearly 20,000 people injured who were cycling, which is I think far too many, and I think the discussion we're going to have now is looking both at how we can increase the popularity of cycling, but also improve the safety. And I think, um, Gabrielle, if you start, then introduce the topic. Yeah, good evening everyone, and many thanks for the introduction and the invitation to this forum. Uh, my name is Gabriele Schlieber, and I'm working at the School of Environment, Education and Development at the University of Manchester and discussing four wheels good, two wheels better. I would like to share a bit of my experience um, working and also research uh, within the Manchester Cycling Lab, which is a research project that I developed, developed together with James Evans from the University of Manchester and Steve Turner, who's head of Future Cities at Manchester City Council. And my perspective on cycling is maybe slightly different than expected because my main interest lies in sustainability transitions and new forms of collaboration to facilitate innovation and sustainable development in cities. And actually before I started to work on this project, I just used my bike and to get around and haven't really thought about it. But over the last month, I really discovered the bike and also big data as a major tool to yeah, create, initiate a positive change within cities. And also as a result of the Manchester Cycling Net project, I will continue now uh, with the PhD further investigating the digital economy uh, for sustainable transport transitions and continue to focus on cycling. So, and the core idea of the Manchester Cycling Lab was to turn Manchester into a real life laboratory for the study of cycling. So, we tried to facilitate applied research projects um, using the existing research capacity of the university. And central to the approach is the so called quadruple helix model for knowledge driven innovation, which is ba basically more than the collaboration between four stakeholder groups, which is academia, the public sector, the private sector, and most importantly, people. So the starting point was to identify needs and knowledge gaps. And through initial consultations and interviews, we could engage with a wide range of different stakeholders, which was within the University of Manchester, but also Salford University, uh, Manchester City Council, and Transport for Greater Manchester, its main key stakeholders to address, but also local bike businesses, feature everything, uh, and local cycling groups and, and campaigning groups, and uh, over 670 people that are represented by uh, survey respondents, because we did an initial survey to, that has the purpose to improve uh, the cycling experience in Manchester, and to identify needs and ideas that citizens in Manchester have on cycling. We asked very open questions, like for example, what has improved your cycling experience in Manchester? And very frequently, uh, people answered segregated cycle lanes, resurfacing, contraflow cycling in different locations, um, Trixie mirrors at traffic lights, but also none that I am aware of. Uh, further, we wanted to ask if you were in charge, what would you invest your money? <coughs> Again, seg segregated cycle lanes, pothole repair and resurfacing, safe junction design, training cyclists, car and bus drivers, uh, and improved policy. 
we also would like wanted to know if you were a researcher, what would you research? And here the answers were rather targeted social aspects rather than infrastructural aspects. For example, driver attitudes towards cyclists, socioeconomic benefits of cycling, best practices from other cities, uh, why people don't cycle, and also by the old discussion by cars and cyclists jump red lights. And finally, we also asked, is there anything else you would like to tell us? Uh, and this actually gets to very interesting and diverse answers, like increasing cycling means restricting driving, bad infrastructure is worse than no infrastructure. I didn't know that you could report potholes, uh, but also cycling is great fun, and thank you for doing this research. So as we see with the outcome of the survey, uh, it indicates that the promotion done in Manchester and many other UK cities already goes into the right direction, but there's still a long way to go facing just a 2% road share. Uh, and also to make cycling an acknowledged and yeah, an acknowledged and integrated means of transport. And so, when we ask four wheels good, two wheels better, and we live in a city and not on uh, George Orwell's animal farm, uh, we also need to know and understand who is the target audience. And there was a very famous study from Portland, uh, done by Portland's bicycle co coordinator Roger Geller in 2006, who categorized four types of transportation cyclists. And in Portland, it's the case that 1% are the very strong and fearless cyclists, so they would cycle under every road condition. 7% are enthused and confident. I would come myself to this group, I think. Uh, then further, 60% are interested but concerned, so they don't cycle, although they are interested. And 33% say, no way, I love my car and I would never go on the bike. And and I would assume that in Manchester the, the share would be yeah would look slightly yeah similar with maybe one percent strong and fearless and one percent enthused and confident and the rest among those that, that don't cycle yet. Um, and so looking at the huge number of interested but concerned people, uh, we also need and also how our city design and the culture addresses this large percentage of citizens. Um, I think, yeah, it's a, and how the city embraces this group of citizens. I would argue it's less about four wheels good or two wheels better, but more if we live in a city that's made for cars or the city made for people. And this leads to the theoretical approach of the Manchester Cycling Lab, because the goal is to support this transition from an unsustainable transport system towards a cycling, towards a cycling city. And in transition, transition theory, there are six steps to it. Uh, first, you need to analyze the system, create a baseline scenario to measure potential and progress. Secondly, develop a strong shared vision, which is in this case Velocity 2025, which Nick will probably <laughs> talk about more later. Um, and then it's very important to explore pathways to, to connect those goals, the current system, and there where we want to go to. Uh, and therefore, we need to explore new pathways and ideas and opportunities. Uh, but further also to experiment, test and demonstrate, to learn and monitor and evaluate for continuous improvement. See what works and then implement this within program structures and regulation within the city. And with our project we try to mainly feed into the exploration of new pathways, like for example identify needs, uh, do research on smart infrastructure planning and also addressing Manchester's green economy. And going back from theory again into practice, I would briefly like to introduce some of the projects we did. Uh, some were tailored to the knowledge needs that we identified, for example, a case study of Berlin's cycling transition and what can Manchester learn from it. Uh, but also, cost number travel behavior in Russia to uh, challenge or solve the, the on street parking issues. And further, also the experimentation with new solutions, which was, for example, research on cycling apps for smart infrastructure planning, so we investigated if it's possible to use the existing uh, cycling app Strava um, to see popular, to identify popular routes within the city and see if this, if the user of this app are representative for Manchester and they're so, sorry, <laughs> uh, and therefore directing the audience <coughs> into the right direction. Uh, further, we also analyzed opportunities and challenges for bike businesses 
especially focusing on site logistics. Um, and we also organized a pothole party, which was an event in collaboration with Love Your Bike and Manchester City Council to, uh, yeah, on the one hand side, on the one side, uh, encourage people to report potholes and road hazards, but also raise awareness for this issue in an entertaining way. So in further discussion, uh, I would again like to highlight it's not just about cycling, but really it's about livable cities at a human scale. And since there's still not national funding in the UK, we also need to start to measure what matters, which is, uh, and make visible what's currently invisible, like the movements of citizens, or pedestrians and cyclists within the city to direct <coughs> investments, but also make cycling accountable for the benefits through uh, increased cycling levels on economical and social side as well. And therefore, we really need to uh, be able to engage citizens to create some smart and sustainable cities. And also, thirdly, most importantly, we need to create space for discussion and experimentation, because a forum like this, I think, is very important to uh, bring people together, discuss the issue, identify uh, or create a common language and identify the problem to really create solutions that will address all needs and all different interests. But also not stop at the discussion, but also show leadership and start to experiment and do things um, in order to continuously learn and improve. So, thank you. That was. <laughs> Influence, of course, by the work we do at Transport for Greater Manchester. But if there's anything that I say that really outrages you, then please do just get cross with me and, uh, and not with my, um, with not my employer. <laughs> the disclaimer, I think that is. <laughs> um, I've just got one slide tonight, one slide after that, uh, this one that is. Um, and that's really by way of setting you guys a bit of a challenge because um, I want you to try and put the travel mode to work to the characters I'm just about to put up on the screen. So you're going to have a choice of train, tram, bus, cycle, and walk. So I'll put them up now. These are real people. These are people in my office, taken uh, just uh, one morning last week. And uh, I don't know if anybody wants to start thinking about that, about who, who came by, uh, by bus, who, who was on the train or the tram. And I guess the answer is, we've no idea, do we? We've no idea which of these, uh, four of these came by whatever mode. But I think we can all be fairly clear about who came on the bike. My question is, why does this person feel they need to get dressed like that to come to work? Because the rest of us don't feel that we need to get dressed in any particular way to go on the bus or on the tram. Just, just, to, uh, just to explain, actually, <coughs> We have walk, cycle, bus, tram, train. But I also know that this guy on the end here uh, cycles to the station uh, before he gets on the train. <coughs> there may, of course, be some very good reasons why <coughs> Danny dresses the way he does, and that's to do with the length of distance that he cycles, the speed he cycles at. Danny would be one of our strong and fear, fearless cyclists uh, to use that Portland category. Um, and, and I just want to say that in no way am I saying anything against the Dannys of this world. In fact, the more Dannys of this world we can get cycling, the better. That's great, absolutely fantastic. And in fact, if it wasn't for the Dannys of this world, we probably wouldn't have cycling quite where it is on the agenda today um, in terms of the, 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 the sort of level of uh, conversation it's getting and the level of... Um, exposure it gets through government. But what I would say is if we confine our market to the Danes, if we confine our ambition to the Danes, we're going to miss out on a huge opportunity. 
So my question is really to look at some of those other cities. And we can look at Copenhagen, and we can look at Amsterdam, we can look at Berlin, uh, but I just want to reflect a little bit on Cambridge because that's a bit closer to home, and I just happened to be there over the summer. And I was there when the students weren't there. And if you've never been to Cambridge, and I actually hadn't been to Cambridge for a long time, it's quite mind-blowing looking at what goes on there in terms of the amount of cycling. And this, is, this was a city, uh, a city of 120,000 population or whatever, going about its normal business. It wasn't all the students, it wasn't influenced by any of that. It was just a, a normal, everyday working city. And this isn't, uh, these are my observations. They're not robust uh, statistical survey in any way. But I'd say it was roughly 50-50 helmets, no helmets. I'd say maybe one in five wore some sort of high vis. There was virtually no Lycra. Nothing, hardly anybody was in Lycra. It looked to me like it was roughly 50-50 men and women. I'm told actually the split is 42% women, but it looked roughly 50-50 to me. And people were just dressed for going to work in their normal clothes. So can we do a Cambridge here in Manchester? Well, obviously I think we can. And we've set some very ambitious targets to try and get to doing a Cambridge in Manchester. Um, well, not quite a Cambridge yet, but we aim to sort of double our number of people cycling by 2017 and double them again by 2025. That's what we set out in that Velocity City Bid document. Uh, and we said that we could even stretch that target to a 10% mode share if we had uh, additional and continued government investment. But whenever we ask people what puts them off cycling, we always get the same answer. And it's whether we ask them directly through, through our sort of e-newsletter surveys, whether we ask people at Manchester Skyride, we did a massive survey there, not this last one, but the year before, about so talking to recreational, occasional cyclists, what puts them off, or even if the British Cycling asked their members or the AA their members, we get the same answer, and it's the answer that Gabriel was talking about earlier, which is about we need safe, secure places to ride. We need to feel that we have space as cyclists on the highway, space that we're, we own, that we're comfortable within. And that can have a lot of expressions about what that space looks like, but people want that space. So what does that mean for me as someone working for the public sector? Well, I think it means two things. I think it means that we need infrastructure that works. And we also need attitudes to be changed. Now, the infrastructure that works is a bit easier for, for us as a public sector because we at least have some control over that. What, what I mean by that is we want cycle lanes to be continuous and to go to places where people want to go to. We don't want them stopping in the middle of difficult parts of the highway. Where possible, we want those to be segregated. They can be on a whole range of different sorts of segregation, separate cycle tracks, off-highway facilities, uh, protected cycle lanes using sort of various proprietary products. Um, and interestingly, even Cambridge, with a 22% mode share, who don't have a huge amount of segregation in the minute, um, but do have a lot of opportunities for cycling through green spaces, through the parks, etc. They reckon there's another 20% market to capture, and so they're going down the route of moving in to segregated cycle lanes. They've already got nice wide cycle lanes, but they're moving towards segregated cycle lanes. What else do we want? We want surfaces that actually work. So we need to deal with some of the pothole problems, we need to deal with the clutter and the, uh, and the debris in cycle tracks, and there's a big revenue issue and that's quite challenging sometimes for local authorities. But we also need to deal with surfaces where we're talking about off-highways, so that we actually get all weather surfaces rather than muddy tracks during the winter. And we need safe and secure places for people to leave their bikes, and that can be a whole range of different sorts of facilities as well, but they need to be confident that the bike will be there when they get back. Attitudes that need to change, I think, are slightly more difficult. We have a, a travel choices team at TFGM, and they do lots of great work. They go into businesses, they engage with businesses, they do business support, uh, travel training, they'll do uh, help set up bicycle user groups, they'll do events there, they bring in doctor bike sessions, all sorts of things to encourage uh, cycling. 
They do all the sort of cycle training, so if you go on to tfgm.com forward slash cycling, our website, you can go on and do one-to-one -one cycle training on the road, you can go to learn to ride courses, you can do cycle maintenance courses, book onto those things. So, so they run all of those courses. They provide lots of information in terms of mapping, newsletters, leaflets, etc. But we still have this issue about attitudes. We need to get cycling to be part of the solution, thought of at a political level, right at the top, part of the solution, not part of the problem, and it's still often seen as part of the problem. We need to get these transport investments right involved in facilities right from the very beginning. We're actually retrofitting in a minute, and that's much more difficult. So new schemes need to have cycle facilities in them. And perhaps more challenging, we need the highway code, I think, to do with the refresh. We need to start thinking about different ways in which we expect different users of the road to work with each other. So sorts of things that could make things a lot easier is if we allow cyclists to make that left turn. Yes, we know they need to give way to pedestrians, but that would be a great start in things. If we make sure that motorists that are turning left have to give way to anybody going straight across, dealing with that, that sort of side roads issue. And perhaps more radically, we need to look at this whole issue of presumed liability. Where does that rest in terms of if there's an accident? At the minute, it's for the, motor, the cyclist to kind of claim that the motorist was at fault. I think there should be a, uh, a presumed liability that the motorist is deemed to be at fault unless they can show the cyclist was. And equally, that the cyclist is at fault if there's an incident with pedestrians rather than the other way around, come to show that. So there's a whole lot of challenges around attitudes there, I think, that we can do a lot about. I want to, sorry, I'm nearly at my end. I just want to leave you with a few thoughts. Um, I'm a bit of a pragmatist. We're only at 2% mode share at the minute. We're not going to get to the ideal place that we want to be in terms of our infrastructure immediately. But if we can get 80% there to go, I'm prepared to shift around on the other 20%. That means if I have to compromise on some lane widths, in order to get a continuous cycle lane in, and we have to drop a little bit below our 1.5 minimum, well, maybe we have to do that initially in order to get, get that infrastructure in place, to get that building that momentum. Is double and doubling again really possible? Let me give you some, a, a couple of statistics. The 2011 census for journey to work in Greater Manchester had 25,000 people cycling to work and 800,000 going to work by car. We know from other work that we did that about 30% of those 800,000 going to work trips by car are under five kilometers, under three miles. So there's roughly 250,000 trips. I know it's 240,000, but it works better for me if I have 25,000 and 250,000. So if I can just get one in 10 of those trips to, to move into cycling, I've doubled my number of people cycling to work. And if I can just get three in 10 of those, I've doubled and I've doubled again. And that's where I really think our opportunity is. So great, thank you Danny, carry on cycling. Please encourage your friends to cycle. But what I really want to get into is an environment whereby people are really comfortable, really happy about cycling short distances, and in fact, going on their bike. It was the expression you were using at the beginning. You thought, you didn't think of yourself as a cyclist, I think. You just used your bike to get around, and that would be a great place to be. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dick. For a long time I was in London at the Times and um, amongst a number of my jobs was transport correspondent for a while and also lobby correspondent within Westminster. So I do have a, a quite unique understanding about a number of issues that hopefully we'll get on to later. The reason I'm, I'm here tonight is that I run, one of my jobs today is running a website, it's fairly new, uh, we're less than a year and a half old, it's called Northern Seoul. Uh, we have a team of about 40 <coughs> journalists and we use it very much as a celebration of what happens in the north. We focus on culture, on small businesses, lifestyle, 
we interview people we think people might want to read about. And for some time now, I've been thinking as, as the editor and the founder of this site, that we should have something useful, really useful that we do, maybe in association with a charity or something really proactive. And once I started thinking about this, cycling became the obvious thing for us to do. I'll give you a bit of background about why it's so important to me before I, I tell you about our, our new campaign. My uh, best friend is a journalist at the Times. She's a lovely girl called Mary Bowers. She was 30 this year. Nearly three years ago, she was cycling on her way to work in London, going to the whopping offices of the Times. She was at a junction that she goes on every single day. She was about 9.30 in the morning. She had a high-vis jacket. She had a helmet. She'd had a bike, main, had a routine maintenance two weeks before I know because I was with her. And she was in the cycle box at the front. She was doing everything she should do. And she must have been in the cycle box for maybe 10 seconds. So the lorry that was the front of the queue had more than enough time to see her. And in fact, there were a couple of cyclists to her right. Anyway, the lights changed and the gentleman driving very big uh, lorry behind her wasn't concentrating. He was actually acting as a human sat-nav to another lorry driver. He didn't speak English. Later transpired that he'd actually been driving on an illegal license because he was doing double the amount of hours he was supposed to do to send money back to his family in Romania. And he didn't look. And so he went to turn left and he went over her. He hadn't even noticed until people started screaming at him, at which point he jumped out of the cab and forgot to put the handbrake on. So the lorry kept going. Mary was very severely injured. Every bone in her body was broken apart from her left arm, and she suffered an artery. She was airlifted to the local Royal London Hospital for emergency treatment. Unfortunately, as with a lot of these traumatic injuries, her brain began to swell, and a week later they had to remove the front of her skull to save her life. Um, it did save her life, but she will, she is and will remain in an extremely specialist neuro care home in Essex for the rest of her life. She's severely brain damaged. Um, she was the girl who, when she walked into a room, her smile lit it up and lit you up. I'm sure you all have a friend like that or a family member that makes you feel special whenever you meet them. And Mary was that girl. She was 27 when the accident happened. Today, she can't smile. She can't speak, she can't eat, and she can't move. We've no idea what's really happening inside. You veer between, oh my God, I hope that she doesn't know, to the other side of the spectrum where that last vestige of hope that your friend's still there. Now, I know this is a really graphic account of an accident, but I'm certainly not the only person who has a friend or a family member that this has happened to. And as someone who works within the media, I'm fully aware that often news stories just recount the accident or the injury and then nothing else. Very little is said about the repercussions of this for the person involved, for the family and for the friends. So we decided at Northern Seoul that we'd launch a cycling campaign. It's a really simple premise, we're not trying to change the world. We're just launching a campaign which is going to be called Cycle for Change. And what it will do is press for change, for improved safety, for improved relationships between road users. I'll get onto that shortly. Um, it's early days for the campaign. We have a cycling correspondent at Northern Seoul who runs a column called Ride right in the North, and he set up a virtual cycling club. And the reason that he's spearheading that and not me, and fortunately he can't be here tonight because he's had a family bereavement. But the reason he's doing it is that we want to be positive about cycling. It's not doom and gloom. We want people to cycle more. We think they should, particularly in the north, where there's just so many beautiful places to get on your bike. But we don't think people should be afraid to get on their bike. We don't think parents should be afraid to let their kids cycle to school. And we don't think you should have to put on a suit of armour before you get on your bike to go to work. So what will, will happen with the campaign, which will have an official launch in approximately three weeks' time, 
will be a, a, probably starting off with a five-point plan but what we'd like to see happen. Very deliberately starting off with a small number of points so then we can create a conversation with people who are real experts in this area, who are road users, who are cyclists, who can come to us and say, actually, we think this is really important and this should be on your agenda. But to begin with, we'll certainly be pressing for cycling proficiency to be compulsory within schools. We believe that you should be taught very early on how to be a cyclist. And if you're not taught at school, then you're probably never going to learn. We think lorries should have safety measures and they should be compulsory within cities. It costs approximately £800 to fit a lorry with basic safety measures that would have saved my friend Mary's life and certainly would have prevented her from being in the position she's in now. And I'm talking about simple measures where it will beep in the cab if you're close to someone and bars on the side of a lorry that if you did hit a cyclist they wouldn't be dragged under. They'd be bounced off, they'd hurt themselves, but they certainly wouldn't be in a position where they're airlifted to hospital. We'd also like to see, and I know a couple of the speakers have touched on this, rolling long-term funding for cycling. Unlike some other funding from central government, there isn't a regular committed amount. It tends to be big amounts thrown at issues when the government of the day wants to win a few votes. We think that's wrong and it also means that local authorities and councils can't plan for the long term and it makes improving cycling infrastructure very hard. We also think that there should be a better legislative system for people that do hurt cyclists. And I know it's not, there are a lot of cyclists that ignore the highway code and not saying there aren't. That's why we think there should be better education around cycling. What we're saying is that, for instance, with my friend Mary, because if, if, this, if this driver, this Romanian driver, who, if he couldn't speak English, presumably couldn't read the road signs. Um, if he'd killed her, the judge could have sent him to jail for up to seven years. Because he gave her something which is basically, and I don't use this term lightly, a living death, they couldn't send him to jail. He got banned from driving a lorry for eight months and a fine based on ability to pay, which was about £2,000. And if you read a lot of news stories of similar accidents, you'll find this happens again and again. And the judge said, I would have loved to have been given you a more severe penalty, but the law doesn't allow me to do that. So that's where we are. As I say, it's early days. And really what we want to do is to create a debate. We want to create what I think Nick was saying is um, space for uh, a dialogue. We want to encourage political change very little political will to do anything, particularly about improving safety for these big lorries, because it might prevent haulage companies from coming into cities. Um, and I know that certainly this has been a problem in London. And we want to make, as I mentioned earlier, people aware of the long-term consequences of what happens when someone's injured. A death gets reported more than someone being hit. You'll hear someone who's injured on the road, but then you never know anything more about it. Um, but also, as I said at the beginning, we want to be positive. It's not all doom and gloom. We want people to feel that they can go and cycle and they shouldn't be afraid. Um, I guess what, what I'm saying is that we'll be doing a similar thing to the Times campaign, which is called uh, Cities Fit for Cycling. That was launched in direct response to what happened to Mary Bowers that day outside Wapping. And they've certainly, it's been very successful in terms of raising cycling awareness, that creating debate. The government, as a direct result of the time of campaign, committed an extra £15 million to cycling safety. The problem is that a lot of it's focused in London and the South East, and the North doesn't really get to look in. In London, for instance, when there's been a terrible incident with a cyclist, you see what are known as ghost bikes around London. And these are cycle cycles which have been painted white and attached to a lamppost where that person died. And it's a permanent reminder that someone died then, you should be careful. Um, we don't have that here. We, don't, we also don't have, as far as I can see, a really sustained, cohesive campaign which says enough is enough. Now, and I'll give you an example, but I tried a number of cycling charities when, because I'm in the process of making a lot of phone calls and trying to establish relationships with people who care about cycling and the relationship between road users. None of them so far have wanted to get involved, 
because they're worried I'm going to say something negative about cycling. Now, that's all well and good, but if you're going to bury your head in the sand, then nothing's ever going to change. So what we want to do at Northern Soul is say, we love cycling, we think more people should do it, but we don't think that people should be afraid and that people should have their lives taken away from them for the point of maybe 800 quid changes on a lorry. Anyway, so that's, that's where we are today. Please, you know, do have a look at the site. We'll be launching it in a few weeks. We'd love people to get involved and to tell me what they think. And then we'll see, you know, where we are perhaps in six months' time. Thank you. cycling, as uh, I imagine most people here do. Uh, a lot of cycling going on in my family. Uh, my father-in-law, for example, has only just recently, he's 70, only just recently stopped his trips to Venezuela to go up and down mountains, uh, which he kind of used to do sort of twice a year. Uh, he still goes off to Spain and France. He's taking groups of 10 or 15 people at a time around the uh, the hills and roads of France, you know, so uh, a very keen cyclist. Uh, he's organised trips to the velodrome, which he's dragged me along to. My son was in the London Youth Games doing BMX riding. He loves his BMXing. Myself, I love my fixed wheel bike commuting in the morning in London. It feels like going on holiday in the morning. You sort of get up, you know, sometimes the sun is shining quite often nowadays, actually. Um, and a uh, very pleasurable experience. Uh, uh, going into going into town and all the sights of London that you see, you know the landmarks. Um, it's such a great experience. So, as Helen said, it's not all doom and gloom. It's a, it's an enjoyable thing, even in the heart of London. Uh, so I love cycling. I know lots of people who cycle. People my age, you know, they tend to be around where I live. Every, everywhere you go, middle-aged men are now cycling and buying the gadgets getting lighter and lighter bikes, and, uh, but generally they tend to do the whole weekend thing. Um, uh, commuting seems to be um, becoming more kind of casual thing, you know, people just jump on their bike uh, and, and head into work without the gadgets. So you could say, you know, what is there to talk about? We all seem to agree uh, on cycling being a, a, a great thing, but there are a few things that I do have a problem with about cycling. Number one, the fact that cycling somehow now seems to have to bear the weight of just about every uh, social issue that we want to talk about. Um, somehow the whole nation is going to lose weight, get healthier, save the NHS uh, by getting on a bike. Um, I like cycling, it's fun as I've said, I like my son doing it, he likes leaping over things on his BMX, but saving the NHS, I mean that's not what we're thinking about, uh, you know, reducing the cost on the burden on the NHS. Not something we're really thinking about when we want to go out and have a bit of fun. Not many other activities get that kind of weight put on them, or uh, reducing congestion, um, or uh, uh, saving energy, uh, getting people out of cars. So I think that's my first issue, is that cycling kind of has all of this uh, stuff layered onto it. And I don't think it's really fair on it, really, because it's, uh, you kind of lose the fun aspect um, uh, that, that you kind of want people to just enjoy themselves. If they want to cycle, they can cycle. If they don't want to cycle, is it really our job to go around uh, social engineering and trying to force people to cycle? Um, so that's my first, uh, <coughs> first problem with it. Um, my second is that it kind of follows on from that, that then funding uh, becomes discussed as something to do to encourage people to cycle rather than to uh, meet demand. You know, if you've got lots of people going cycling on a particular route, say in London, then it, it seems to make sense. I can understand why you would uh, start to change the way the roads lay out, lay down, or maybe you know, reroute things, or maybe create a, a cycle path or whatever. But it seems to me a very different thing to be saying, right, we will now create these uh, things, this infrastructure we will now re-engineer the city, a city that somehow uh, is not made for people. I don't know how we've arrived at that notion that it's made for cars. 
Um, uh, we're going to re-engineer uh, these things in order to promote something changing. I think that's kind of the wrong way to do it. There's millions of pounds being talked about here, tens of millions of pounds. Um, so I think there's more of a discussion that somehow, perhaps it follows on from the first point, perhaps it follows on that because cycling is going to save the world, um, and we're all saints, we're all saviours, then somehow we're entitled to tens of millions of pounds being spent on us, hundreds of millions of pounds people are asking. Um, you kind of wonder what the rest of the country is thinking, you know, when this small group of people really are sort of uh, demanding these uh, quite fundamental changes. Changes to cities like London, I mean, it's not going to be Copenhagen, I used to know. Um, so that's my, my second thing. And then my, my, my final thing is the, is the, I don't know quite how to explain this, but it's something that I've been thinking about more and more recently when I cycle into work, is the idea of encouraging people, this kind of war on micro, Encouraging people to think that cycling in central London is just something you, you jump on your bike and do um, without being afraid. I mean, we're talking about heavy machinery basically being moved around feet away from you. You know, buses, lorries, cars. Uh, I'm afraid. Every day I go in, I'm, I, I want to be afraid. I want to be, I want my wits about me. I don't put earplugs in. You know, I enjoy the scenery, I look at St Paul's as I go past it. I love going over Blackfriars Bridge when the sun's shining uh, and, you know, looking at all the architecture. But I'm afraid and I want to be afraid because it shouldn't, it's not something you should take lightly. And I think we're kind of doing people a bit of a disservice if we, if we kind of imply that, hey, you cycled when you were nine, oh, that's okay. You can now cycle when you're 50 and go through central London. Now that doesn't mean you know things can't uh, can't be changed, but I think we have to be really careful to uh, do the kind of Boris angle. He, he's often referring to you know it's not like right? it's not people uh, you know, put a suit on, a suit of armour, as somebody described it. You know, uh, London is a is a difficult place to negotiate if you're driving. Never mind on a bicycle. <coughs> I think we should be careful about that. Um, so those are my things. I'm not kind of. Uh, uh, you know, imagining that nothing will change. I'm not imagining that money shouldn't be spent, but it kind of feels like a very one-sided thing at the moment. The, uh, the, the cyclists are going to save the world, and, and, and we want hundreds of millions of pounds to, to do it. There's just a couple of things that I wanted to pick up on that the speakers have said and maybe get them to reflect back on what's been said by some of the other speakers. I think uh, the first one is just around this um, trying to get 10% um, modal, 10% of uh, transport being by cycling. Now I was looking at the statistics and that happened in the 1960s. 1960 in the UK, 10% of all travel was by bicycle. And the amount of people we would now for nationally have to get to do cycling as their mode of transport would have to be the same level of cycle miles that was done in 1946 to be equivalent to um, the level to get 10% of the total mileage. So that's a big challenge. That's that's, and I like big challenges. That, but that's quite a. It's not a small thing. It's a large thing. So I'm just wondering, uh, across the panel, how realistic do we think we can achieve that, and how big do the measures need to be? And then I think there's been some issues raised about safety, because I, I I noted from the the latest round of government statistics on road safety. They put the improvements in safety down to generally less speeding by cars, technology and engineering advance, which I think relates to the devices around vehicles and things, and improved trauma care, which means more people survive, and so there's less deaths. And I think amongst the panel, we were also asking for some more to improve safety, you know, not cycle campaigns have different views on safety. So I'd like people to just, I think those are the two core challenges we're looking at here is how to get more people cycling and be a greater mode shift. 
and how can that be done while making things safe? So, does anyone want to reflect on that? Do you want to start and we go back? Yeah, so may I just start? We're being referring. filmed, so if you can speak yeah. into the mic. Uh, so I would <coughs> like to start referring to, yeah, to the goal or to the ambition we should have. And I actually would think that 10% is still too low. Uh, and because what we need to do is to, to measure a baseline scenario, really to see what, what is the potential. And I think it's a good comparison to see how the model share was in former times. But since our city has also become much more dense at the moment, it's more than 50% of the population is living in cities. And cities will just become denser and denser. And people need to commute out of the city and back. And there's just not the space for cars. And if you compare the size of the bike and the size of the car, and then maybe make a similar study as it is important, or maybe it's not even necessary to compare because we know there are a lot of people that want to cycle, but they don't. Um, so I would say we should be even be more ambitious and say 20% or 25 to to really also meet the needs a city have of mobility because we even get more and more stuck in traffic due to population growth. And Manchester is a great city; it's become more attractive. Business businesses come here. But we also need to be ready to react to this in an intelligent way and therefore also show ambition. I think we need to uh, reflect on what we mean by 10% mode mm -hmm. share because one of the things that's happened since the 1960s is that the average distance travelled by individuals has increased enormously. So there is a lot of longer distance commuting that goes on and for many of those trips, it, was, it simply wouldn't be appropriate. But I come back to those figures earlier that I presented earlier, that 30% of car trips in the morning peak are less than five, miles, five kilometers, less than three miles. So I'm not talking about a massive change about people doing lots of longer distance cycling and getting into all of that. I'm talking about people that are hopping in their car and going a mile and a half or two miles. And there's lots of reasons why it's sometimes necessary to do that. But there's lots of reasons why it's not necessary to do that. And for all the reasons that other people have talked about, about the way in which you as an individual often feel when you're actually cycling, and the, the sort of brightness and alertness it brings to your day, I think that's, that's a very good reason just to start it. But I do think there's an equally very good reason, which is around some of the inactivity debate, and getting people to be cycling because their quality of life will be much better in older age if they continue to be active. <coughs> maybe, maybe if you two want to reflect on the, the safety side of things because there's, <coughs> there's a campaign within the EU which is called Vision Zero which is trying to have no road deaths at all and no injury accidents which is obviously a noble thing but it's, it's looking at those steps how we get there. I think the, the point I wanted to make is that it's all very well for the government to say we've reduced the number of road deaths, but at what cost? Because someone who hasn't died from a cycling accident can have, for example, life-limiting injuries, uh, no quality of life, or a very reduced quality of life. So I think there's far too much emphasis centrally put on the number of deaths and not very much at all put on well, what do these 20,000 injuries mean. Um, and th the other point I would make is that there's also within the central government statistics, there's not an awful lot of drilling down into where these accidents happen and the severity of them. And the, the, just one thing I would say is that when we launched the Cycle for Change campaign, we're working with road safety analysis to get those very, very um, specific stats about the north of England. They used to be a government body. Uh, the government got rid of them so they became independent. They have over a million pieces of information. And at the moment, they're working on pulling out cycling in the north of England at a hyperlocal level. So we're going to be doing that in a few weeks' time, and hopefully that will contribute to the debate about actually what the difference is between a cycling death and a cycling injury, because for some people it's not very much at all. Um, 
See, obviously, no, nobody would not have sympathy for somebody who's been injured or, um, or killed, or particularly, you know, the family. One morning, I was cycling in, and uh, I came up to a junction uh, that I uh, was knocked off in the past by another cyclist, as it happened. Anyway, I came up to a particular junction on the Blackfriars Bridge, and in front of me, uh, there was a lorry with a mangled bike underneath it, and it took me a while before my eyes kind of realized before everything came into focus, that I realized that there was a corpse uh, underneath uh, the back wheels. Right, right, in, you know, I'd literally been seconds, seconds behind this whole thing, you know, coming over the hill. So, and that, I dwelt on that for ages. Should have, was that any sign that I should give up cycling? You know, I'd only miss it by a short period of time. Uh, you know, uh, what about my family, my kids, if I get killed on the way to, is it really worth it, all this kind of thing. So, nobody would not have compassion. I thought about his family, the following week I cycled over that route and there was no indication that somebody had died on that spot. And of course you start thinking, how sad is this guy, his family, they've gone to a funeral, all the rest of it, and it's gone, it's evaporated. So of course you go, Anybody with any compassion would go through all of that. But then you start thinking, but why is that any different to any other death? And why is that 109 that Keith mentioned at the beginning? Why are they more special than any other particular, um, and in fact, fewer in number than other deaths that are happening on the roads? You know, and, and that's the bit where I'm, I'm, I'm not saying I can't be convinced, you know, but it, that's the bit I'm having trouble with is the idea that somehow um, the government, enough is enough, we hear these kinds of phrases, enough is enough. In London, you, you talk to people, it's like, they're dropping like flies, cyclists are dropping like flies, it's just rubbish, you know, it's not the case. People are dying every day of all sorts of things. Um, and I have trouble uh, making this some kind of uh, special uh, uh, thing. So, yes, lorries could be fit, you know, that's, that's fair enough, but I think we, even by campaigning for those things, we then make, we, we somehow tell the rest of the country, the rest of the world, that cyclists are special. And I, and I think that just creates the wrong dynamic. There's no wonder then that you end up with arguments cycling in in the morning with road users. Because they're looking at, they're, they're thinking, well, everyone's telling us that cyclists are special. Cyclists believe it because they're, they're going to save the world from global warming, they're going to regenerate the health service, and, and uh, and, and now also their death is more important than anybody else's death. It's not surprising. You know. Anyway, I, I, that's, I have real trouble with this. I'm afraid. I think it's time to uh, throw it out to the audience. To, I'm sure there's lots of views here. But I also just want to put one thought in your mind about uh, this very technology that you were talking about. I, was, I had um, the benefit of driving one of these uh, brake assist vehicles last week, week before last. And um, the dilemma they put to me was that they can have it happen automatically or have it happen once the driver hits the brake. And at the moment, they're not allowed to do it until the driver hits the brake. And that's the dilemma they're in, and they know more lives would be saved but there's a legal responsibility issue that they're dealing with. Now, it just so happens I was in this car that had a crash assist. It had braking assist and it actually had a crash while I was in it. It wasn't me driving at that stage. But there is that dilemma about should it be the software that saves the lives of the people. So there was a hand just there. So you can say who you are with that. Uh, my name's Dave. I live... Uh, in Stockport, sort of local to Manchester. Can I help? Uh, um, the chap from London, thank you very much for coming up, but I just want to take a couple of issues with you. Cyclists are special. They're not surrounded by a metal cage. Of course they're special. Um, about building routes and uh, saying that don't build routes until, until there is a need for them. Well, you know, when they built roads, they did that because there, were, there was a need for them before the routes were there. So, I, you know, by building cycle routes, you will encourage them. Um, uh, um, I can't remember what I was going to say to you. But one of the th main things I want to say is that no one's mentioned this. 
It's about encouraging people to cycle. It's not just that people don't cycle because they're afraid of the roads. I think that is a good point. But if you go to schools and look in their bicycle sheds, you won't see them full. If you go to colleges, you won't see them full, apart from Cambridge. <laughs> Cambridge is full of cycles. But in general, it's not cool to ride a bike. <clears throat> and one of the reasons that people, Danny is it, wears his Velcro stuff, and part of it's for practical reasons, it's also to look a bit cool. Uh, you know, so I think what we need to do is to somehow promote cycling to young kids as being cool rather than naff. I'll maybe take two or three and it can be short and snappy to give everybody a chance. So man just there in front. Uh, John Tarp is my name. Uh, my two quick points. The first one is to Dave. The problem isn't the cyclists think they're special. The car drivers think they're special. They think they're entitled to drive around in their ton of uh, metal and everybody's got to get out of their way. They think they're entitled to leave their ton of metal on the side of the road wherever they feel like it, and so on. So car drivers just think they're special, not cyclists. But the other point I want to make is, as an engineer, which I am, uh, when you get involved in any kind of dangerous activity, the health and safety executive are over at like a, a dose of, a, like or whatever, uh, you know, climbing anything like that, massive amounts of uh, training, supervision required, uh, any, the slightest accident investigated by the health and safety executive, the company can be liable. Why doesn't this apply to driving as an industrial activity? All these trucks are being driven by people at work. Why doesn't the Health and Safety at Work Act apply in those cases. Why isn't Eddie Stobart being hauled before the courts? Because his machinery isn't properly guarded and taken. Uh, and I think that applying that kind of attitude, uh, the health and safety attitude, to that part of the industry and that part of driving could be a big part of changing the attitudes of drivers and of people who are sending drivers out without time, without uh, proper training. Good point. To the man down the front here. <coughs> Hi there, my name is Chris. I'm a physiotherapist and I'm involved in health promotion and post cancer care. Um, one of the thoughts I had was there was a lot of talk about safety and a very harrowing example about how risky cycling is and how dangerous it, dangerous it is. But I think that needs to be reflected in the benefits of cycling as well. A lot of the statistics I see show that there's a, a 10 to 1 ratio of health benefits over the costs. Um, and if we keep on talking about safety and improving safety, it just highlights to the public that it is a dangerous activity. But a far more dangerous activity is sitting down driving a car because you're not exercising. Um, so I think we need to make sure we target the safety recommendations to the specific companies, but not to the public. The public need to be targeted with um, recommendations about the benefits of exercise rather than scaling. afraid to use a bus or a tram or a train. I use my bike to go to work. I don't think I should have to feel afraid to do that. And I think that's the argument for a transport infrastructure that allows people to feel safe and normal using a bicycle. So that's why we should invest in safe routes. Two, two quick comments. One, um, I um, tend to I cycle occasionally this summer from Bolton to Swinton. Um, and it's the first time I've done it this summer. I used to cycle a lot more to work. Um, and I've been very pleasantly pleased by the attitude of drivers. 
And I do think there is something about trying to say to drivers, you know, thank you for looking after cyclists on the road. I've been quite surprised by that, really. Um, the other bit is I don't actually trust the, st the statistics, um, particularly from Nick. Um, that thing about 30% of drivers in the morning, a lot of that's about people taking children to school. And you're not going to get them to swap over to cycling. So in my mind, that distorts the figure. You, are, you might want to, to encourage them not to take their cars. I agree with that. But I don't think you're going to get many of them cycling. Anyway, it's just a point of view. There may be a different one to that. <laughs> So I, um, so I just deal with that last one first. Um, I agree, I'm sure a lot of those are short trips to school. Um, I'm not sure that why you're saying we can't get people to cycle. I think it would be great if kids were cycling to school. I think it would be great if parents were feeling uh, that they had an infrastructure, that they were comfortable taking kids on the front of their bikes or on the back of their bikes. It works perfectly well in lots of other places. Even my uh, favourite city at the moment of Cambridge, I saw lots of people travelling around with kiddies in trailers or at the front. So I think it can work, but equally, I, I, I'd agree. I mean, we need to do a lot more about getting people walking to, to school and all that sort of thing. But, um, but it's still getting people out of cars and into other modes. That's where I'd like to be. Yeah, I would like to refer to the comment on stereotypes of cyclists and also how this can affect children's choice to, to cycle not because there's also very interesting research done in social science, for example, <coughs> Uh, young girls between 16 and 24 were shown pictures of, of a girl in Copenhagen cycling with an umbrella without helmets and wearing high heels. And it was so absurd for them. They were saying, oh no, that's completely wrong. She's not wearing a helmet, she's not wearing high vis, and all these things. And being shown uh, women cycling in a the velodrome, they said, oh, this is a proper cyclist. So then the world was all right again. And that's really the, the cultural difference, how also children grow up. Uh, when we continue to talk about cycling is a dangerous activity and you need to be a cyclist and not a bicycle user. Uh, and this also needs to be visualized with campaigns that really address different types of people. Because there was also another research done um, on stereotyping cyclists and finally, for example, uh, being shown a road bike that was um, referred to as yes, uh, reckless or sportive or mammal, but also coffee to show that that's something that just affluent people do that also want to copy maybe some of the images uh, transferred with the image of a cyclist um, and that can even put people off cycling because either they want to use this image to be projected on themselves or on the other side that would maybe put people off cycling to an important business meeting because they would uh, be seen as this uh, kind of stereotype. So um, yeah, I think it's a very urgent issue to, to tackle as well and we need to transfer the image of cycling being normal and diverse and not yeah insist of the too much insist on the safety issue when you communi communicate to the broader public. Yeah I'd just like to address the point of licenses um, from the lady there. I don't personally I'm well I'm, and the, that campaign will not be in favour of licenses for cyclists. I think biggest effect that would have is put people off cycling. Having said that, I do think sh something should be done to encourage, maybe even to force cyclists to follow the highway code. Um, I mean, I'm sure all of you have got examples of watching cyclists jump lights, ignore lights, turn before they should, not wearing the right clothing. Um, and the statistics, I know a gentleman said they don't trust the statistics, but it has been widely reported that it's men who are worse at doing this than women, which maybe will come as no surprise to some of you. And actually, in terms of cycling deaths at junctions, it's far more women who are killed or seriously injured at junctions because they actually do follow the highway code. So they wait by the side of the lorry for the lights to change, and that's when the lorry can't see them, whereas the bloke's already you know, on the next street. So I certainly would say no to licenses, but I do think something, and I at this point don't know what, should be done to make cyclists follow, even just the basics of the highway code would be an improvement. 
Sabe que é o novo tempo? É o novo tempo. Eu não sei o que você quer dizer. Eu não sei o que você quer dizer. O Highway Code não diz que você tem que estar no interior de uma lorry. I mean, that, that's the, that is the strange thing. I think that the thing is that if you try to make it rule-based, then I, I do wonder whether you create the idea that, that, that as long as you follow the rules, you're safe. You know, that's the, that's the thing that does worry me. So, for example, I was one day, came up um, uh, in a cycle lane to the traffic line, and this guy in front of me was just sitting there with his earphones on looking around, and this van to our left was indicating left. And he was oblivious, and I tapped him on the shoulder and said, "You, you know, do realise this van's indicated left?" And and so he pulled his bike back. There's no reason to be right at the front, you know, sort of raring to go. But you're right as well, you know. If you, this, I do think that central London, particularly, if you can't pull away faster than a bus, you've really got to seriously think about whether it's the best place to be cycling. Um, if if you can't get away from the traffic lights faster than the other vehicles, I, I don't think that's a wrong thing to say. I don't think that's kind of unfair and, uh, you know, people shouldn't have to be afraid and, you know, people should be entitled to share the space. You know, it's, a, it's, a, you know, it's not the same as getting on a bus or a tram, uh, as you were saying at the back. You would like it to be the same. That's different. Yeah. I mean, let's agree that you would like it to be the same, but I don't think we should pretend it is the same. You know, skiing is not the same as walking. Hence you know, the need for investment. What, in skiing? No, <laughs> in safe routes. What, in, again, in skiing? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's like different, different routes, different ways of doing things, different things are next to you. Uh, cities have different layouts and different history. So to try and um, uh, re-engineer them to cope with this kind of um, thing, it's not, I'm not saying it's completely impossible and certain things shouldn't be done, but to begin with the starting point that we are going to make everything super safe, I think that's, that's, that's sending the wrong message to people. It's quite refreshing, more quickly to say, to, to hear um, this point about drivers, you point about them being pleasantly surprised. Because when I say that to people at uh, dinner parties or whatever, people just don't believe me. I say that most motorists are pretty damn good. And most motorists are aware of people more than some cyclists. You see cyclists pulling out without even looking behind them and stuff. Car drivers just go around them, they don't start a fight. I think most cyclists are unaware of how many times they haven't been killed. You know, I think that's what happens a lot. Well, I think we should all be very grateful to the car drivers for not killing them. <laughs> <laughs> just, just a point on the, the separate use, separate lanes and cycle lanes. Um, a lot of the research has found that the more provision you have of separate lanes both segregated on the road and off-road, uh, the more people cycle and the safer it is uh, for the people who are cycling. And that research has been shown all across the world. The issue comes of how do you do that on a very big city with lots of buildings that have got restrictions on what you can do. So, And that's the challenge that Nick faces in Manchester. So. Let me take some more. I'll start, I think I might start at the front of this side and work back and then from the back of that one and work forward. So, come in front of you. Hi, I'm Claire and uh, I'm passionate about cycling. I, I got rid of my car about a year and a half ago and I cycle to work every day and like a lot of people here, I don't think it's the motorists I'm worried for, it's myself and other cyclists. Those are the biggest threats to me. And one thing that I think is great about living in Greater Manchester is we've got um, a great tram network, and I think one of the things that we lack, like if I'm going to go out and ride on the hills in Rochdale or Oldham, I can't, it's an either or situation, I, I can't take, I don't have a car, why can't we join together better the public transports we have, networks we have with cyclists? You know, you, you said that you cycle when you get the train, and the train you can put your bike in. Why, when we've got this amazing tram network, can we not have a space to put a few bikes in? It would just mean that more people can bike yeah. and get out more. For fun, you know, I can use daily for work, but I want to go out more for fun. Okay, is there anyone else on this side? Or no? just there. <coughs> Brian Good, I long gave up commuting anywhere about 20 years ago. But if you go into the suburb where you cannot reasonably have cycle lanes, I think, 
but what you do need is the traffic to slow down um, so that in fact children can, can go out on the road and cycle, which is where cycling starts anyway, and where children do it. So I feel that um, although not a huge amount of money is required, a lot of speeding needs to come down. As we, we have traffic near us that goes <coughs> much too fast from time to time, and I think that we need uh, methods of stopping them speeding, really, in, in, in suburbs, where not huge amounts of money is required. Obviously, commuting is a marvellous thing if you can do it, but an awful lot of people who merely want to go along the road with their friends if the traffic was slower. Hi, it's Kevin, Kevin from Stockport. Uh, I regularly commute on a bike. And what I would say is exactly that, is that I feel safer when the traffic's moving slowly. Uh, that's the uh, cycle lanes don't really, uh, they don't really appeal to me. I don't really use them because they don't, they're not very effective, I find. However, when the cars are moving slowly, that is where I feel safe. And I think I'll be for a cheap, easy way to encourage people back on cycles. I'm just wondering whether people think we can get uh, to the position where somewhere like Copenhagen, Copenhagen has gone. I had a fascinating presentation from the head of their cycling policy where they've now implemented dual speed cycle lanes. So the fast lane and the slow lane down all their major routes to try and deal with the cycling congestion. Do we think somewhere like Manchester we can get there? We don't have space for one. Um, hi, I'm Rick. I live in London and I work at MMU. I think we're sort of maybe missing a key sort of starting point here. And I, I'm, I'm kind of wondering why people are here. Um, and I see, I don't think it's necessarily because we all think that cycling is just inherently good. I think it's, for a lot of people, it's enjoyable. It is a healthy way of getting around. But I. For me, it's because we want cycling to be a viable option for people to take as part of a wider um, suite of options that are, in general, about reducing <coughs> road traffic, about reducing congestion, and about reducing our impact on climate change. Uh, is, that, is that not a, I'm interested to, in people's opinions as to whether is the key thing here climate change? And I think if we take that as a starting point, um, there's a lot of, there's much bigger things to address um, than just necessarily safety or um, infrastructure. They are, they are big questions, yes, but um, I'd, I'd be interested to know sort of how many people here were on the protest the other day against climate change. I think there's, there's much bigger questions that need addressing. And sorry, I don't want to come across like I'm arguing against any of the good suggestions people have put together to forward tonight, today. Um, but I feel like there's a sort of missing link. Uh, I think we're probably mostly here because of climate change. And we want cycling to be an option people have as a way of mitigating our impact on, on the environment. Um, and I think that means addressing lots of the bigger questions. Lots of what we've talked about is about government investment. It's about changing the way our cities work on a, on a big scale in a way that challenges um, and will inevitably challenge business priorities. Climate change, mitigating climate change doesn't, is the big thing and I think there's a, there's a, there are bigger questions that need addressing and sorry I don't think I've spoken very clearly there but I'm interested <laughs> okay. in what other people think about that issue. Okay, there's a man in the middle there and I'll call him to speak to you away for a while. I am Chris, a city centre resident. The woman at the front I'd like to mention that last week I read on the Metrolink website that they are testing the allowing of bicycles on the Metrolink. I don't know what that means, but that's the latest news. Anyway, as a city centre resident, often I would uh, like to say that I prefer to walk rather than cycle because it's a complete.
campaign in the backside across the city centre. I would prefer to see a vast reduction in the number of uh, traffic lights for traffic control in the city centre. I'd prefer to see all the roads restored to two-way traffic. If it becomes a horror story, I don't care because it will put people off. But I'll be able to find a more direct route when cycling from one part of the city to another. Additionally, I'd like to see more destination parking for my bicycle because uh, it's not much fun if you have to walk a couple of hundred feet to find a bar stuck in the road to park up your bike. You know, and it's like, well, it takes two minutes to get over there, maybe I'll just walk it. I can walk across the city centre in 15 minutes, but to take five minutes to, unlock, uh, to walk to where my bike parked is too much extra time. So we still two way roads, get rid of all the traffic lights. That's more for me. What's your policy about? <laughs> um, were there any people behind the manager's spare wants to say anything? Um, did you want to yeah. say anything? Uh, so the point at the back about um, climate change, there seems to be an overlay that isn't substantiated uh, and is just assumed and I think you made the point in your slide, Gabrielle, that what we've got at the moment is unsustainable and we need to uh, get people out of their cars. And then uh, Nick, from a different angle, uh, argues the case that we've got to get people out of our cars, at least on short journeys, for the betterment of their health. You wouldn't do the same, you wouldn't argue the same, Maybe you would, and it'd be interesting to uh, hear if you've got the courage of your conviction. But home workers who aren't exercising at all, aren't travelling anywhere, you wouldn't impose the idea that they have to exercise for the good of society. Hi, I'm uh, Paul Father for Cholton Cycling, is my regular commute, but I drive as well. I kind of dress like Danny. But I think I probably cycle as fast as me. Uh, it's, it's not cool. It's not, it's not <laughs> cool at all. But just a couple of people. One on the cycle there. So I'm a bit ambivalent about taking stats, but I don't, I don't think I get a lot of them. Often they're full of potholes, other parked cars in them. And the thing is, when motorists see a bunch of cyclists in the cycle lane, they, just, they zone it out there. They don't see many as the crystal lights down in their cycle lane. But they don't see parked cars in there on the pothole there. If you're going to have to play over. So I think the safest place to be is in the middle of the road because then they see the hazard and they do something about it. You don't see if you take the hazard perception away, then you know, they can't react to it. I do agree that I think that I don't think there's anything in encouraging people to or driving people to cycle for their health or for climate change or anything like that. The only reason I can find out about cycling is for fun, because it's good fun. And the, the biggest bit of fun about it is for me is when I get my bike in the morning and I say, well, being scared or anything, I feel really responsible. I feel like I'm responsible for myself in a really important way. I have to look out for the traffic in my job to do that. I have to look out for pedestrians or the kids stepping up the Dean's Gate Challenge all the time. It, it is a freedom, but it, you know, and that, that's what's great about you. You get to work in the morning and you are awake as where I've got it, so I'd half an hour playing with the traffic in the morning. And it's not completely safe, but I think it's mostly safe, but you have to keep your eyes open. <coughs> Hi, my name's Andrea and uh, I'm a lifelong car driver and for the last three years I've done a lot of cycling as well. And um, in contrast to the gentleman's comment at the back about how surprised he was at how considerate drivers were, I think it's a bit worrying that we think that's a surprise. Um, I was surprised the other way at how um, aggressive a significant minority of drivers were to me for no apparent reason. Um, but actually, when you think about it, there's a lot of aggression on the road anyway, whether you know, to other car drivers or to, to cyclists or maybe to pedestrians. Big difference is that you're so much more vulnerable when you're a cyclist. Um, and I'd just like to link that to a second point about education and the highway code and cyclists needing to comply with that. I totally agree and I get very frustrated when I can see cyclists doing things which you know, irritate drivers uh, because they're being thoughtless about those drivers. Um, but it is also necessary for drivers to be aware of what the highway code is and how it applies to cycling and what cyclists' rights are on the road because a lot of people think you don't really have any rights at all. 
on my particular, particular irritation at the moment is the cycling <coughs> box at the front because we're talking about extra cycling lanes. Um, I've been wanting to start a blog with pictures of cars in cycling blocks in front of me because I would say it's the majority of the time more cars than not will pull in and stop in the cycling box when they stop at the line. So I think that would be really interesting and practical point you know, for your campaign. Hello, I'm James. Um, I would absolutely encourage home workers to get up off the chair and go out for a walk, not a bike ride, at some time during the day. No problem with that at all. In terms of the cycling stuff, the licenses question, I've yet to see a great deal of evidence that licensing makes the drivers of motor vehicles follow the highway code. Why should they from <laughs> And uh, I can't run buses. I don't do it. I don't need to do it. I've learned how to position myself on the road, how to take control of situations. I would advise everybody around the place to have a look at cycle training. Get some professional training. It is really good. And Red Manchester is absolutely free. I was a cyclist for 35 years before I did it. I'm a very different cyclist now than I was before. Here, here. I think it's a great idea. Now, I've got two people at the back who wanted to say something, and then I was going to bring the panel in unless there's anyone else who wants to ask a question or make a point. Yeah, there's been a lot of um, talk of the survey evidence about what people want, and I've just wondered whether anyone's uh, been asked in the survey whether they actually want to be encouraged, um, or how their attitude or behaviour changed by the council. Mm -hmm. uh, did you want to have a hand the second? Okay. Apologies for speaking twice. Um, to say, I've just come back from a study tour in Assen in the Netherlands, and it's picking up on thing about punishing drivers. Um, Assen has a modal share of 45% of people cycling, um, not 2%, 45%. And it isn't about punishing drivers, they actually have probably a higher car ownership than we do. Um, they also have free parking. It's about making cycling easier and cheaper and quicker. And so people cycle. They can drive if they want to, they choose not to. So it isn't about punishing drivers, it's about making a system safe for people to cycle and walk. Uh, Rachel, Rachel Stanley, I'm an IE team member and a, a cyclist. Um, I want to pick up a, a point about safety. Um, as a, a motorist, I see um, cyclists frequently not taking responsibility for their own safety in terms of the lights that they use. Um, it is um, sometimes very difficult to see cyclists who are riding at night without any lights. Uh, and I wanted to um, draw the room's attention to that as it's not been mentioned so far. Anyone else? Any last burning? Oh, there we go. Uh, well, I'm fully in favour, just that last point, well, I'm fully in favour of cyclists having good lights, and I will always have good lights on my, my bike. If you're driving around in a ton of metal, you should have sufficient illumination that you can see the things that are in front of you. It's not other people's job to be bright enough for, for you to see them. You should provide the illumination to make sure that you can see other people. Right, I'm... On that point, I'd like to thank yourselves, the audience, for what I thought a cracking quizzing of the panel and a uh, good discussion around the subject. And I think I'll bring the speakers back in in the same order as we started. I would like to refer to the comment on climate change, which I really appreciate because that's actually my main motivation. So I have a background in business and I studied environmental management and policy. And Somehow I discovered that the bike to be a disruptive technology to challenge different sustainability issues because you can't start talking about climate change or sustainability because people, some people just don't care or they don't... Uh, sustainability is also a very intangible 
word that's also often misused or overused. Uh, and so you need to, need to break it down to something everybody can identify with. And I think really, as Pete says, cycling becomes um, a rational choice for everybody and it's become easy, then it will be, we will be able to sustain ourselves socially and economically and also environmentally because a system that's dependent on the car and also a system that supports cyclist death, for example, is not sustainable. And yeah, therefore, yeah, I appreciate the, the comment and I think it's good to really identify different motivations why you cycle and it's diverse. So I wouldn't judge comments on, yeah, I'm against motorists or I'm pro cyclists. It's really everybody finds its own definition or its own value in cycling or also maybe not cycling. And um, yeah, that's basically my comment. Um, I just wanted to pick up on that uh, comment around uh, punishing people by forcing them to uh, take exercise. Um, I'm not really uh, wanting to do that. What I want to do is create uh, an infrastructure, an environment whereby people can do can cycle, which does mean taking exercise, but without really thinking that that's what they're doing. So it's really just getting that exercise into everyday activity. So I'm not trying to say you must do this, but I want to create a, a, a sort of infrastructure whereby people feel that they're quite happy doing that. Um, and then by virtue of continuing to do it, particularly if they're cyclists, they continue to do that into older age. That has great sort of um, health benefits. Uh, what else? Highway code and cyclists. Um, yeah, one of the things that really riles me is when I see cyclists jumping red lights. And that's because it makes my job so much more difficult when it comes to talking to politicians and decision makers because everybody has their red light jumping story. But I don't think cyclists are alone in jumping red lights. Often, it's often said that cyclists do it at the start of the cycle and motorists do it at the end. People, people jump red lights sometimes in the, uh, in, the, in the traffic signal cycle. Um, I guess the last one I have to deal with is Metrolink and tram and uh, bikes, isn't it? Uh, I, I was hoping I might get away with that, having to deal with this. There's an official answer and there's my answer. So, um, as we're being recorded, <laughs> I'll give you mine. Um, if you were on a, a busy tram coming into town in the morning peak, the last thing you would want would be a cycle, somebody trying to get on the tram with a bike. And, and I think that's probably a fair comment. Uh, but equally, if you're on a tram on a Sunday going up to Oldham, where there's not very many people on, you'd probably think, why on earth can I not take my bike on this tram? And I'd have a lot of sympathy with that view. And the difficulty is defining when you can do it and when you can't do it. Um, and people say, well, you could say, well, you could always do it contra flow. But contra flow doesn't always work because contra flow is all you know, if I'm at Heaton Park Station, there's 60% of people going into town and 40% of people going to, to Barry. It's quite hard to say you can't go contra flow. So you could say, well, maybe we do it at weekends and we do it evenings. And my guess is that at some point we'll end up at some sort of compromise around that. That, of course, is not the official TFGM line, uh, but we won't go into that now. Thanks, sir. Uh, just a couple of things. Um, I'd like to say finally, the issue of uh, cyclists taking responsibility for themselves, I was really encouraged to hear some really positive comments about that, particularly from this gentleman here. Um, I would take issue with the fact that the gentleman over here talking about cars should have, presumably what you're saying is better lights. As a driver and someone who has uh, an intermittent cyclist, I suppose I call myself, if someone, if it's, even if it's dusk, never mind dark, and a cyclist hasn't got illumination, they're just a shadow, you can't see them. And I don't think a lot of cyclists who don't drive realise this. Um, my, my last point would be the idea about responsibility for car users as well. And I think the, the point about aggression on the road, absolutely right. We are quite aggressive drivers. I mean, I don't know if any of you have ever driven in London, I used to drive a car every day in London and it was sheer hell. And you'd get to work really cross no matter what had happened and it would see at least a couple of instances of near misses for cyclists and cars and between cars themselves. So I suppose my, my final sort of 
thought for the evening is, you know, how do we dilute that aggression on our roads? I don't know what the answer is to that. I'm hoping that in a very small way, the Northern Soul Cycling Campaign will open up a debate on that. And if we do nothing else with the campaign, then that would be useful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so what a fantastic discussion. I've, I've been looking forward to this for ages, but I didn't think it was going to be as good as this. It was great. Some really good themes coming up. Um, so I'd like to echo the responsibility one. I thought that was uh, some really good points coming out there. And I think it is, you know, it's your life, so save it. I don't, I don't quite, I can't go along with the idea that, uh, you know, if somebody else doesn't see you, it's all their fault kind of thing. You know, I think you really have to um, survive. Hey, survive out there. You know, but it, it's, you do, you have to take responsibility. I think there is another element of responsibility as well, though, that um, shouldn't I be allowed to choose how I maintain my health? And if I, uh, if I want to go climbing instead of cycling, I don't quite understand why society should be engineering itself so that I'm going to exercise by cycling without even knowing I'm doing it in this unique kind of uh, Orwellian uh, way uh, on the tram or not kind of thing. It, it does, it, it, you know, responsibility is the same issue of responsibility. I mean, I might decide that actually the key to a good life is learning to play the violin and speaking three languages. So what, am I going to start now getting hundreds of millions of pounds off the government to, to pursue that? I mean, it is, it is a little bit disturbing that there's one particular view of how life should be lived is, is sort of taking over. And it's not even a particularly forward-looking view. I mean, the, the, the great uh, challenges that you describe of climate change and, uh, and uh, um, the, the, the society is, is looking at, rather than uh, harnessing all of the power of science and technology and... Uh, computing and all the rest of it, we're going to get a few derailleur gears and uh, a shiny uh, uh, day glow uh, jacket. You know, I mean, it's really, it's a pretty low-tech solution to the world's problems. So I think, yeah, like I say, I think responsibility is a key. There's many great issues raised, but for me, those are the ones I'd flag up, is that it's a pretty low-tech solution to a big problem uh, as well. I think we should thank all of the speakers in the traditional way.